And here we are once again on Global Toronto's final day. I'm Alan Davis at the Small World office, and it's a delight to be with you once again. We have a, an artist focus, uh, an artist spotlight today on uh, someone who wears multiple hats. We'll get to that very shortly, Eric Stein. But on a personal note, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I just want to say how delighted I am at the success of this iteration of Global Toronto and how I'm humbled by the energy and dedication of the amazing GT team. John and Umer, Shanley, Ala, Reza, Bridget and Sephora, along with Derek and other advisors and partners have really knocked this out of the park. Yeah, I think we have something special here. When I started this little enterprise called Small World 23 years ago, I never would have imagined that something like this would transpire. Of course, there was no pandemic then, and there was no internet either. But uh, anyway, things were different. That's my little message here from Small World and from my heart. Here's to the team, and here's to next year. Now, onto the topic at hand, Eric Stein. Someone who, as I say, has multiple roles in Toronto's music business and sector as artistic director of the Ashkenaz Festival and as a busy musician with Beyond the Pale and other projects. Ashkenaz celebrates the Yiddish and Jewish culture through its biennial festival and year round programming. It showcases the work of leading contemporary artists from Canada and around the globe, working in music, film, theater, dance, literature, craft and visual arts. It's an event with a huge community impact and well beyond their 25th anniversary takes place next year, hopefully in a post-pandemic world. Let us now check a short clip background on the Ashkenaz Festival. Here's the video. I love the food, I love the music. I'm just having a great time. We love tell you about Ashkenaz Festival. It made me the happiest woman on earth. It's just so inspiring. Fabulous. Amazing. Smorsai il fuoco, il fuoco bruciato, il bastone che bruciato, il bastone anche il cacca, bruciato la catra, catra mangia il capretto. It's a really special thing, and, uh, and if you've come to this festival, you know. And if you haven't come to this festival, make sure that you come the next time. There you have it, a taste of the Ashkenaz Festival and its great programming. As I say, 25 years is going to be under their belts very shortly, so that's a very impressive run. Eric Stein, congratulations on that. Thank you. It has been a great run, and you have done sterling work. Tell me just very briefly where Ashkenaz stands and it will segue from there. Uh, well, this summer was supposed to be our 25th anniversary. And um, so what we've been doing over 
the summer is um, reaching into our archives. We have 25 years worth of amazing stuff to, to roll out. So we've been putting some of that out. And during our festival week in the first week of September, what would have been our actual festival, we'll be showing a whole bunch of uh, archival stuff from the last 25 years. And it's actually worth noting, Eric, that of course, both you and I, with the Small World Festival in September, are being uh, are part of the Global, Global Music Month. Right. in which we're collaborating with a series of American and Canadian presenters to celebrate global music throughout September online. So please, I hope people who are watching will notice that a global music month, there'll be lots of uh, notice about that. Ashkenaz and Small World teaming up again. So let us, let us go to one of your other hat wearing jobs. I keep referring to your hats. Uh, and this of course is a longtime member of Beyond the Pale. Um, as, as, inspired by Klezmer and Balkan styles, but informed by everything from classical music, jazz, reggae, and funk. Beyond the Pale is a remarkable band with a 20 year history doing everything from raucous dance rhythms and funky acoustic grooves to complex instrumentals and chamber music styles. Let, uh, Eric, we'll, we'll talk obviously more about that. I just wanted to mention as well that over the course of 20 years, you guys have played throughout North America, Europe and beyond while garnering acclaim and awards. So let's, Check out some of their videos now, A Taste of Beyond the Pale, and we'll explore that. Does that, does that work for you, Eric, or do you want to talk more about uh, Beyond the Pale? No, let's watch. Okay, let's, let's watch Beyond the Pale, a segment of their music, and come back and explore them deeply. Let's watch the video now. Good evening, and welcome to Here's Room Live. So my name is Derek Andrews. I'm the music programmer here. We're delighted so many of you joined us tonight to welcome a band that is some of the best players in the country, and we're going to let you hear them right now. Please welcome Beyond the Pale. Well, we've got this new record out called Ruckus, and we're really happy to finally have that out. It feels like a bit of a rebirth for Beyond the Pale. I guess I didn't really think about how long this band would last when it started, but um, to be here almost 20 years later and still be going and making vital music, uh, that means a lot. That's something really unique and really special. It's really hard to describe music with Beyond the Pale. It's really a confluence of different things. It's a klezmer band, uh, it's a Balkan band. A little bit of Django, uh, hot club. Classical music, jazz, bluegrass, reggae. Occasionally I would say even romantic moments. I feel like the audience is able to connect with the music because it's created from a place of honesty and uh, it resonates with people because of that. Beyond the Pale's music has a, a, a natural sort of joyous quality to it, but there's also a seriousness and an intensity to it, and the range of emotion that comes through in the music that we're playing. What can I say about the new album? I'm not sure. There's a lot of original material that, uh, that sort of defies Boris from everywhere. We're continually playing different styles of music. We bring original music into the project. We rearrange existing material that comes from a vast uh, 
array of different places, and so there's always a surprise to be had. In general, it's, uh, I would say, happy music. People who come to see this band are, in, in a lot of ways, just interested in hearing creative acoustic music played in a very intimate way. People who like jazz like it because there's an, a sophistication to the way we play as an ensemble. Um, I have a lot of classical music friends who, who like this music. Uh, everybody, what are you talking about? Everybody likes this music. What's not to like?
beyond the pale sampling of their work and it, some uh, amazing sounds generated by the acoustic band, something I want to talk to you about, Eric. The band uses klezmer and Balkan style, as, as you said before, as a jumping off point for original compositions that have broad appeal. Tell us a bit about the process. How do you, how do you juggle those elements and come up with what you, what you end up putting on stage? Well, it's definitely, it's a very democratic process. Um, there's no, uh, you know, it's, it's a marketplace of ideas and there's a real love and trust amongst us in the band. Um, you know, the group's been together for 22 years and with the lineup unchanged for the last 18. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty strong foundation upon which to work. And when you work with people for so long and just to develop uh, modes of communication and shorthand, musical shorthand, as well as verbal shorthand, um, the creativity just kind of flows. And that's kind of the essence of the band. It's really something that happens on a very organic level. And, um, you know, these jumping off points, particularly klezmer and Balkan music, they're just that. They are, we're always striving to create something that sounds like us um, and something that's singular and in a way defies categorization very easily into particular genres. Um, you know, klezmer works as a hook for us. It's been it's been a bit of uh, a, a bread and butter kind of way for us to describe who we are and what we do. And we've definitely um, participated really strongly in that scene, which is quite vibrant internationally. Um, but we've played jazz festivals and folk festivals, um, classical chamber music things. Um, Bluegrass fans like what we do. There's a bit of a twang to it. Mm -hmm, There's a mm -hmm. bit of an Americana kind of flavor. We've toured in the American South where people had never heard klezmer music and maybe had, you know, never even really heard Jewish music in any way, but they dug what we did. And um, that's kind of the the most gratifying experiences I think I've had in that band over, over the last number of years is playing for people who didn't know what to expect um, and just kind of enjoyed the music for what it was. That's, it's, an, it's an interesting point. And again, like, like a lot of groups that I've spoken to over this, this week, there's obviously these elements of tradition and, and if you want to call it modernity or other influences. So, and again, the organic nature of what you do. So you don't necessarily want to be limited by any one of them, but do you consciously sort of say, well, this is going to have a, a jazz feel or this is going to have a bluegrass feel. There's obviously some kind of um, information you're coming in with, right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I think that we're... Um we're probably not th that rigid in terms of saying, okay, now's the moment when we're going to sound like a jazz band or we're going to sound like a klezmer band. I mean, if anything, probably there are moments when we, when we decide, okay, we want to do something that is going to be more traditional or more linked to uh, traditional styles. But um, for the most part, on a purely artistic level, we're really striving to create a sound that's, that's our own. You're wrong. And that sound is, is very much an acoustic sound, isn't it? I mean, you, you remained... Uh, that way throughout the, the longevity of your career. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a, a huge part of the sort of artistic flavor of the band, the fact that it is acoustic, uh, the fact that there's no drums. We have worked with hand percussion, which fits mm. in nicely, um, but it's definitely an acoustic sound. And, um, you know, what I think is really uh, impressive about our sound at times is how much rhythm we can generate and how much... Uh, volume we can generate how much right. energy we can generate but also how quickly we can pull that back and reduce the dynamic to practically mm -hmm. nothing i mean that's i think one of the the real hallmarks of our sound is, is mm -hmm. how broad the dynamic range is um and how intricate the arrangements are you hear every instrumental voice come in and out of the arrangements and complement each other and uh, dialogue with each other and that's really the essence of what our creative process uh, produces. And no, no one's no one's pulling out a Stratocaster with a distortion pedal and riding over your your sound. Yeah, but, yeah. but it is interesting. Some, some people might say, "Oh, you're limiting yourselves by doing acoustic instrumentation." But as you say, the d dynamic range is there if you know how to exploit it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that 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 makes us particularly unique. I think within the klezmer world where a lot of the bands are driven by brass and a lot of wind instruments and drums and, and a big sound, you know, a big brassy kind of sound. We're more like thinking man's klezmer in a way. Uh, we can play dance music and we certainly have. We get hired a lot to play community events and weddings and parties and things like that, which keeps us connected to the social and community uh, context of the music that we're rooted in. Um, but when it comes to the sort of 
art piece of what we do, um, we try not to be bound by by satisfying somebody else's expectations. Instead, we want them to come and meet us where we are, uh, and hopefully be excited by what we do. Exactly. You we spoke a little bit about touring when we did the introduction, and you've had you know significant success as a touring group. Partly, I guess, through um, being successful in getting funding to support that touring. Uh, yeah. It helped you get around the world, performing at festivals, theaters, clubs. Uh, speak a bit about that. I know that one of those uh, videos was shot in Poland, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Um, definitely. I mean, we've toured uh, pretty much all across Canada and the U.S. Uh, a lot of European touring. We've been to Brazil. We've been to Australia. And most of our touring, I would say, has been supported in some form or another by uh, grants from the Arts Councils here in Canada, and uh, we're, we've been consistently successful with that. And uh, oftentimes a tour will start by getting an offer from a venue somewhere, where the offer in and of itself is not nearly enough to actually get out and do the gig. But if we've got enough lead time that we can assemble a route and apply for funding, um, that gets us going. And so the last number of tours, the last two, three years have actually been quite active for the band. And um, we just finished our last tour was in, at the end of February on the West Coast of the US. Just we were sort of riding the, the wave of wow. the pre-COVID times by about a week or so. We got home March 2nd and a week later the world exploded. Wow, that's really lucky, yeah. Yeah, but that, that whole tour started because we got an offer from a chamber music series in uh, just outside of Albuquerque in New Mexico. Um, and, you know, the offer was, was a, a decent offer for a gig, but it wasn't nearly enough to plan a tour. But my MO has been, if you give me enough lead time, I'll connect dots, I'll go get grants and I'll, I'll make stuff happen. And that's pretty much how it's happened for us. Well, we are, you know, no doubt we are fortunate to have the support of the Canada Council and others in this country to help export our culture and, and make it work for us financially, because Lord knows it's not, it's not easy on either side of the stage. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, you know, you, you spoke a bit about the longevity of the band, and, and which is very, very impressive. I wonder sometimes, is it, you know, are there challenging aspects to, the, to being together for that long? Are you, are you looking to be like Rush and go for 40 years? I mean, is that, is that a possibility? I mean, maybe it's a possibility. I don't know. We had um, sort of a, a, a about three to four year stretch where myself and another member of the band started families and we uh, were busy with other things. So the band became a little less active for a few years in there. Um, but we revitalized it and, you know, everybody loves what we do together. So I think we'll keep doing it as long as, uh, people want to hear it. Wow. I mean, we'll probably just keep doing it anytime we can. <laughs> Why the hell not, man? Music, music yeah. keeps you young. There's no, there's no two ways about it in my mind. How are you and, and the rest of the band coping with the, the, the situation with the pandemic? I gather you're working on your fifth record, uh, as we speak. Yeah, we have uh, grant support for that. And uh, actually on our last tour, we managed to record a few tracks at the recording studio at UCLA in LA because we, we did a bit of a sort of mini residency there. Um, so we've got about almost half a record in the can. And uh, so probably over the next uh, six months or so, we'll be working on finishing that up. And I think that we're we're going to be realistic about what the time arc is on things and probably aim for releasing towards the latter half of 2021 and hopefully getting active touring by the end of 2021 and into 22. Right. And you said you had a special guest on that, on that record. Yeah. A fantastic uh, Yiddish vocalist from Israel named Vera Lazinski, who uh, collaborated with us on our third record and uh, was in town last summer for some stuff. We did some touring with her. And so we managed to cut a few tracks with her. So it's nice to have her back in the fold. And we've worked with all sorts of other guests, other vocalists and other instrumentalists as well. It's, nice. it's a good way to stay fresh, I guess, to keep the sound uh, exciting, keep yourselves excited about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's always nice to have some fresh blood. And I think that as an instrumental band, a primarily instrumental band, it's nice to have vocals to break some things up. Uh, I've actually started singing in Yiddish over the last few years in order to uh, add a little bit of vocal component to our shows and make it... Um, a little more more of a dynamic experience um but you know when when we have somebody like vera with us it's uh it's like having a super all-star on, on the team so it's great right well i, I look forward to, to to hearing that eric and and hearing you sing live at some point perhaps and i do look forward to uh, the ashkenaz festival online coming up as part of global music month so i hope that goes well for you and i wish you and the festival and beyond the pale all the best 
Thanks so much, Alan. And, and uh, you know, huge kudos to you for all the work you've done over the years with Small World and to see this next iteration of Small World evolving has really been uh, quite, quite amazing. Thank you so much. This is our, this is my last artist spotlight, my last appearance on Global Toronto. I want to wish everyone well from anywhere around the world you're watching. All the best from Toronto. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Bye now.